Hello, everyone. I'm Dennis Cerati, and this is the Mazzini Society Report. We're going to be talking about Herman Melville's classic American novel, Moby Dick, today, and an amazing group of paintings based on the book, along with an essay entitled Lumines, which was created by artist, teacher, and writer Chris Volpe. And we, indeed, we do have Chris Volpe with us today to talk about the book and his paintings. But this isn't going to be a typical discussion, for we're also going to be delving into the deeper meaning of Moby Dick through the words and art of students who took part in a recent conference called Sailing to Madness at Aggie University in Turkey. Headlining our presentation along with Chris Volpe is Dr. Yanja Dennis Arslani, Professor of American Culture and Literature at Aggie University, who recognized in the ur urgent message that Melville left us about our future spearheaded the organizing of this conference. Before asking our group, our guests to share more about themselves and the conference, I'd like to read an excerpt from Volpe's book just to get us started. He writes, many critics consider Moby Dick the greatest American novel because it's alive with what Nathaniel Hilbert calls the DNA of America. And in it, every generation of Americans sees itself reflected. There's 21st century America in the nearly self willful self-destruction of the megalomaniac Ahab, the slack complicity of his uncomprehending crew, and the hijacked ship itself on its brutal and deadly mission. As Philbrick has noted, Melville makes the melting pot Pequot, which is named after a decimated Native American tribe, function as a metaphor for the country by making it carry as many Native Americans, African Americans, South Sea Islanders, Middle Easterners, Nantucketers, and other immigrant Blacks, Browns, and Whites as there were states in the Union of 1850. Also, it's made of wood, Melville writes, that could only be American. First, I'm going to go to, to you, Chris. All right, thanks, Dennis. I am primarily a visual artist. I'm also a writer and I, uh, a teacher. I have a background in American literature and uh, in particular American poetry, but I fell into the world of visual art uh, while teaching some, some classes uh, at, at a night college. And um, they asked me to do an art history class and I had zero qualifications, so I thought, but uh, I loved it and it became a passion and I almost became an art historian. Uh, but before I could, I became a painter. I just kept bitten by the bug. So I have been um, maintaining a career as a professional uh, fine art painter for uh, the last um, 15 or 16 years. And uh, I, I kept waiting for my literary background to collide with my newfound passion for visual arts. And that did happen in the series called Loomings based on Moby Dick. And we'll talk about that. Um, but just a little bit more bio. I'm from Long Island originally. I came to New Hampshire where I live uh, to go to the master's program at the University of New Hampshire. And I still live in uh, Southern New Hampshire here. So I, uh, it's, been, it's been amazing to work with Yonja and to be able to connect with students and colleagues over the miles uh, through this technology. It's been really, really kind of fabulous. Thank you. Yonja, are you going to uh, go next? Thank you. Uh, I'm Yonja Deniz Arslan'ı. Uh, I'm from uh, Turkey, Ege University, Department of American Culture and Literature. Uh, I have been teaching uh, Mopedic more than a decade at the department. So in recent years, me and our, my students have been uh, so enthusiastic about making a project on Moby Dick. And first of all, we gathered and talked about the proposed call for the um, uh, project proposal. We had meetings and then we sent uh, this uh, project proposal to various institutions and uh, Tübingen University Department of American Studies was interested in our project. Uh, Professor Mikhail Butte and I uh, became partners, first of all. Uh, we decided to have joint mobility classes in the fall semester last year. Uh, and uh, he taught 
Moby Dick to his uh, graduate and undergraduate students. And I taught Moby Dick here in Turkey with joint syllabuses. <laughs> and at the end, we decided to organize this panel talks uh, before the publication process of our book, Sailing to Madness. So last week, uh, Tübingen University graduate and undergraduate students and also Ege University students uh, met uh, at our panel talks. Professor Butte and I and several other scholars from my department also contributed to the panel sessions. Uh, and we had these three, three days panel talks uh, um, connecting both institutions uh, from Germany and Turkey. And also uh, on April uh, 6th evening, we had art session with Christopher, uh, his Moby Dick and the arts projects. And uh, our students were so happy, so creative. Uh, they, they felt great to have such a teacher. Uh, I think still they have been so enchanted with what they had done. Uh, I, I am so grateful to Chris. He, he uh, gathered our students with um, five or was it six classes. You had met them online in the fall semester. So Chris was uh, processing the project separately. And April 6 was the first time we saw what he had done with our students. And I'm so uh, proud of my students and also so thankful to him. And we feel really pr privileged to have such an artist with us and having this transoceanic experience with, uh, with him was great, really. Uh, so if you uh, like, we may have this short video of the uh, art session. Uh, now, shall we, shall I share the screen? Okay. So our first task was for everyone to identify a, a thematic foundation for their work. Um, they got work, they get to, um, we did, we had a series of call, Zoom calls for this. Second, by the second Zoom call, they presented drafts and then we emailed back and forth. Um, I then asked for an artist statement, uh, a brief paragraph or two in which each student would create a text to accompany the work and to give context to what you are seeing. And, and I showed uh, some illustrations and some original artwork as inspiration. I showed my own um, inspiration for my own work and talked about how I was incorporating themes into my work. So this is not necessarily the illustration of any, any one aspect of the narrative or any one event in the book. It's, this is one of my paintings that um, wants to imply the peril of um, particularly American uh, society um, on the world stage. As... My work is an oil painting worked on a square canvas. In its first drafts, only the theme of cosmic indifference was there. But with time, I realized I only had to paint what was true and close to me, because I knew that through me, Moby Dick was going to reveal itself eventually. When the main image was finally there, I saw that Ahab was the subject of the artwork and not me anymore, because he was the complexity. 
He was the one that came eye to eye with the whale. He was the restless sailor seeking answers, not knowing to which questions. He was the one that was seeking a one last touch, a grand connection to merge with, against the loss and fragmentation that, that took place in his psyche. In my art work, I wanted to survey the idea of integration between nature and pollution. The pollution is created by human usage of plastic and other materials. But it influences mostly in natural places, such as oceans and other habitats. I focused on the ocean and polluted materials reflection on oceans. If Moby Dick had been written today, there would have been several mentions about plastics in the ocean, such as the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. So there are the integration between ocean and the plastic. And I used plastic materials such as garbage bag and newspapers to give the sense of nature's mutation to plastic. The reason why I wanted to reflect my ideas in that term is the fact that there were not any concerns about the pollution when Moby Dick was written. In such a short period of time, the problem of pollution become one of the most dangerous tragedy, both human and animal lives, and its results could easily eradicate all of us. What Herman Melville could predict was not the pollution problem. My art you see on the screen occupies big part of my life. It is the only listener to whom I can pour out my feelings. Yet for weeks, I thought about how I could paint the emotions and thoughts this book evoked in me. The answer was not the book nor art, which is spontaneous and mostly a coincidence. It was seeing the color of the setting sun, leaving itself to the darkness of the night that allowed all my feelings to be reflected on the canvas. I was surprised that the sign I was expecting was not from the book, but from my life. It was the moment I realized that the book reflected our world so timelessly. In the painting, my biggest and general aim was to show how superior nature is. Despite all the environmental pollution and the damage we have done to it, it has no end. My goal for the dark places was to make a blurry image of oil that is completely mixed together. In the light places that represent nature and spiritualism, I used a thicker and distorted structure with baking soda. It was meant to symbolize how nature is and how it was bettered, but that is always the supreme no matter what. There have been times in my life when I felt like a stranger in my own body and disconnected from the world. Among the themes of Moby Dick, there is the boundary between the mind and the body, the self and the environment. I wanted to explore the sublime philosophy of Moby Dick by using these themes and my experiences. The background represents the sublime sea, while the self is also represented with similar but more intense colors to emphasize the alienation. At the center, there is the black and white veil eye of Moby Dick, representing the terror and the terror that the sublime causes in the human mind. With alienation from the self, the body and the environment, the veil eye appears on the surface. As a whole, the painting shows my journey of reading Moby Dick and how it speaks to the soul rather than to the mind. At the end, one question still wanders in the sea. Is it the state of being lost or of finally becoming one? When I was reading the novel Moby Dick, the features of the whale Moby Dick dazzled me, especially how it is white, grand and mysterious. My vision for my work is partly inspired by the imagery of the whale in Moby Dick. My own philosophical thoughts and important modern painting titled White on White by a Russian artist uh, named Kazimir Malevich. Um, this is the painting that inf influenced me, inspired me, and it is titled White on White. Um, the modern artist Malevich floats a smaller square within the larger square of the off-white canvas, like it is untouchable and otherworldly. And I think this part, the untouchable and otherworldly, um, describes uh, what I felt when I was reading the description of Moby Dick in italic is from Christopher Volpe. 
and I was really stressing about making my painting perfect and he um, mailed me these lines which really resonated with myself and uh, because of that I chose to uh, leave the My work explores several of Melo's symbols of death connected to the character of Kukwek. On this basis, my theme is the point, the point where life and death meet. With influences as diverse as life and death, new combinations are generated from both explicit and implicit meanings. That's why my work's name is A Coffin, A Box, A Life. My digital painting combines, from left to right, images of what is what is Ahab as a destructive force, bringer of death? What was Quick God Idol Yoji, a life garden and perhaps a guide in the afterlife? And what will be Quick X coffin symbol of death but giver of life when it saves Ishmael from drowning? Altogether, they give us pers they give us a perspective of how Mel uses symbols and themes throughout the story in the novel Moby Dick. As I Mm. As an explanation of my artwork, the circles in the painting represent the stages of being lost in dreams, and the dark shadows that try to overcome them represent reality. And there is a feeling of joy, relaxation, and carelessness in the middle of pink, and the yellow parts can be seen as a safe zone. But the red and vivid line is a transition that is hard to pass. You need to burn first to lose your reality and lost mm. in joy. In the There's a chapter way. in Moby Dick that called Castaway and shows us this perspective with the character of Pete. Once he was in the pink era, having all the qualities of being a wanderer, he burned and passed into reality, heavy face. And I took a quotation from it. Rather carried down a life to wandering steps, where strange shapes of the unwrought primal world glided to and fro before his passive eyes, and the misanomic wisdom revealed his hoarded tips and among the joyous, heartless, ever juvenile eternities. Pip saw the multitudinous god omnipresent coral insects that out of the firmament of waters hid the colossal orbs. Sometimes I feel like I am not fully alive, but rather living in a dream. It's almost like we are not real. The only thing that feels alive is nature, which has this overwhelming feeling of being alive. Nature dominates the dark realm that is called the world. Even if we humans like to think we rule over it, we, separ we are not ruling it. We separated ourselves from nature and now we seemingly destroying it. My art represents the dark and the mystic feeling we get from nature, like how Ishmael feels about the painting and the supporter in. Almost in the time of the New England hex, had endeavored to delineate cows bewitched. Ever and anon a bright but alas deceptive idea will dart you, dart you through. It's the blessed of blessed that it's a hyperion winter stream. It's the breaking up of the icebound stream of time. But at least all these fences yielded to that one portentous something in the picture smiths that once found out and all the rest were plain. But stop, does it not bear a faint resemblance to a gigantic? Um, so for my own artwork, I decided to focus on the uh, the idea of the of the other, and how we sort of fail to to understand it, and even even in uh, from time to time, we could be subjected to this idea of the other ourselves. You know, we could be the ones that are uh, being you know outcasts of the society and whatnot. But more so than that, uh, I wanted to emphasize on how we sort of look at things and see them on a on a more surface level and we never really try to look at it from the inside what it's thinking what it's uh what its thoughts are even if it's uh just a simple whale uh 
you, as you can see, there's a uh, there's a 13 colonies, New England colonies in my paint, which is uh, which is representing uh, of the beginning of United States of America, and uh, you can see the arms, you can see the white and black contrast, which is really uh, again connected with the beginning of uh, everything i mean big bang uh, and this uh, this black hole spreads its arms uh, all around the universe like uh, american culture spreads itself all around the world so in the american culture aspects you can see lots of aspects in there you know with this humanoid figures with this uh, with the color of this state you know pluribus unum uh, one out of many, or uh, another, uh, a lot of like uh, you can see c capitalism and many more in there. And nature is a formation that can maintain itself, unlike human. Nature can be described as formations itself, indeed. All creatures constitute nature. That is why nature controls human, even if human doesn't understand nature. Human is obliged to try understanding nature. In contrast with whale's size, ships being relatively small highlights nature's superiority. In addition to its size, thanks to green brush strokes, one can understand easily that whale represents nature. While nature directly looking at audience with confidence, ship barely appears. Ship almost fades away among dark colors, but nature stands out with its whiteness. When human... Yeah, thank you all again. It was am amazing. Regal, yeah. I really uh, feel so grateful to you for your uh, efforts for our students. It's so valuable. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for having me. Um, and thank you for sharing your your students with me. Uh, I'm very proud of all of you. You and, are welcome. Uh, yeah, and, so and, lucky. And also say thank you for your, for your kindness uh, to each other also. I think in... I was I was very very uh, moved by how supportive everybody was to everybody else. It's always really nice to see that. Yes. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, he had this vision, gathering all pieces of you know uh, philosophy, um, mythology, theology. A lot of things are gathered in one book. Uh, therefore, uh, while I'm reading pieces from uh, Bibles. Uh, it's like uh, how I feel, you know, uh, feel like while reading Malvo's Moby Dick, because in Moby Dick, you may uh, co come across with a lot of pieces from Hebrew Bible, from <laughs> uh, a lot of books from the Bibles, and also a lot of references to philosophical um, themes. So uh, when you have the book, uh, it tells you a lot of things. I think that aspect of Moby Dick is also amazing to me. Uh, and also as one of our students in Chris's art session was uh, <clears throat> noticing that uh, at the time, at the publishing time of uh, Moby Dick, there was no pollution uh, at Melville's time, but now we are urgently uh, enduring the outcomes of pollution. Uh, Back then, it was uh, sperm whales uh, oil, and then uh, you know, uh, with the ongoing process of industrial uh, uh, phases in uh, modern capitalism, now we uh, we are to suffer the uh, no uh, a lot of you know uh, a lot of um, uh, how to say uh, consequences of uh, such environmental issues it is not just environment but also people since the pandemic people are more I think alert about the outcomes of uh, global uh, imperialisms going on and I think there is a lot, a lot to think to discuss 
uh, connected to Herman Melville's Moby Dick, and I <laughs> would like to leave your uh, leave the floor to your comments uh, about the book itself, the panel, or the art station, Chris. <laughs> Yes, absolutely agree with with everything there. And um, I, I will say that I was a little bit surprised that the students were not more critical of American foreign policy in particular and the lens of Moby Dick, because as you say, Melville's already critiquing the what he calls the the all grasping Western world. You know, and uh, I found that, yes, absolutely, some students did, in fact, see and pursue the political dimension in their their visual responses. But mm -hmm. seeming just as many um, found psychological uh, aspects of the of the 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 self that Marville uh, is representing um through the various characters and and their interactions. In particular, Ahab, um, and also larger, uh, sort of, you know, the archetypal themes of light and darkness, good and evil, and mm. um, and time. Time was was also a part of that um, eternity, the mort uh, mortality, human versus nature. They were really digging in those big, big ideas, which was really nice to see. Um, I We started with the, the thesis that books are meant to be read uh, imaginatively, inventively. Um, that re you know, we, we, There's a quote from Emerson where he says, one must be an inventor to read well. And so I stress that in in the projects for them that they were not illustrating the novel they were responding uh imaginatively uh and creatively through uh through the through the art and i think they, they really rose to that challenge fantastic interpretations of diving in themes um racial narratives religion mysticism uh self and other um again space time and being they were all all grappling with these things which is great to see um i don't know how um familiar the viewers are with my own work so i thought i would um, do a quick introduction uh to my um my loomings series so why don't i share the screen for a second and that We got it. Okay, great. Just as Yongfu was saying, the the book is really a a lens through which we can view his the historic uh, underpinnings of American society and also our our contemporary conditions. And it seems that every generation that approaches the novel finds a new and equally valuable mirror in which to see in which America can can see itself and view itself. Um, that's kind of the miracle of Moby Dick and the and the genius of Melville. It's perpetually new, as you say, Yoncha. Um, and uh, Nathaniel Philbrick in his short but awesome read, uh, Why Read Moby Dick, calls it, um, somewhere he says it's like, it, it contains the DNA of America. It's, um, it, yeah, it is the genetic code of America. Uh, is contained in the novel, and it's it remains uh, perpetually remains newly important. Uh, and so, what I'm doing in my art with the novel is, um, I'm reading Moby Dick through the lens of the climate crisis. So, I find uh, I, I find in it a metaphor for American hubris and the endless self-destructive pursuit of resources uh, and 
the hunting down of nature. Uh, and, and, and interestingly, the parallel is, is quite a literal one since Moby Dick is, uh, let's not forget, is based on a commercial whaling voyage, which um, Melville makes clear when he gives us the whole chapter on the, uh, the Shaker ship owners and uh, um, exposing their hypocrisies and their greed and the exploitation of the crew members in this kind of uh, industrial hierarchy from boss to the lower tier workers. It's the American factory. It's the, um, it's the patriarchal authoritarian paradigm. And uh, so for me, the, um, the novel can be seen as a comment on um, energy uh, and our, our rapacious pursuit of energy to our own destruction. If it's not whale oil, it's oil from the ground. It's fossil fuels, it's petroleum. So my my medium for these paintings is tar, and it's a, it's a literally a fossil fuel byproduct. The tar I use comes from um, the hardware store. It's the same stuff that is used on uh, it for, as a sealant, and it's a um, it's a toxic residue that is produced by the, re the refinement process, oil. So. This particular painting here was one of the first in the series. This is my interpretation of um, Melville's description of the painting in the Spouter Inn, when Ishmael sees a besmirched and ambiguous and dark painting against the wall and speculates about what it might be, finally decides that it's a, it's a whale, an enormous whale um, about to leap over a whaling ship getting impaled on the three masts as the ship goes down. And so that was the first one. And, and um, I enjoyed the process so much of trying to wrest something meaningful and beautiful from this toxic waste material that I just kept pursuing this. Uh, and I saw immediately that there was um, a, a parallel between oil, fossil fuels, and whale oil. And so each uh, each of these paintings got a, uh, a title that refers to the novel. So there's a particular chapter called To Gallant Sales, and that's the title of this particular painting. So this is tar and oil paint. And it's a three by four foot painting. That's a close up of the ship on the, on the horizon there. Very loosely painted, gestural, abstract. Um, but that particular one, a particular composition is directly based on an Albert Pinkham Ryder painting though. Uh, and it's a, it was just interesting to me that Ryder was from New Bedford, which is where the um, Spider Inn is supposed to be. And Ryder painted with tar. And it was Ryder's use of tar actually that um, inspired me to try it as a medium. This was another very early one in the series. I pro uh, it's called Any Human Thing. Uh, and that comes from the quote, I promise nothing complete because any human thing supposed to be complete must for that very reason infallibly be faulty. So that is the, that's the ship in the, uh, in the center there. Um, this one was a, a surprise to me. I had the entire canvas covered with tar and began removing it from the center and I saw the, the dark sheets of whether it's rain or cavern, some cavernous uh, enclosure or look like curtains as though we're looking at a, a kind of medieval passion play, uh, uh, some sort of grotesque Punch and Judy show of humanity and uh, in peril from putting itself in peril by battling nature and um, it became kind of it became one of the uh, one of the um, key pieces that the ship the motif of the ship on the was was essentially an oil slick uh, became a, a kind of um, constant throughout. This is um, a ship looming from the gloom, and I titled it a Kushnet after the first 
uh, um, the name of the ship that Melville shipped on when he was uh, when he shipped on a whaling boat before he wrote Moby Dick. So um, there's a very 19th century feel to this, and I, um, just just to uh, pro on the process side. The so there's no paint in this one. This is a completely subtractive and then additive piece with just the tar. I treat the tar with a, a chemical that dries that allows it to dry and allows it to stabilize as much as it can. And uh, this was completely covered in in tar mixed with this um, additive. So that it was, it was also very liquid. More, it, it liquefies and becomes a little easier to work with. And so I can pull the, the tar away, and what you get is the the beautiful color that these, you know, these sepia tones that res resemble nineteenth century photographs or um, whale manifests, uh, and that to me have an earthy, warm kind of beautiful quality that's lurking within the dark, you know, very metallic, unyielding black of the tar. So that's simply removed tar, no additional color added. And then the ship I made by going back in with just tar uh, on a palette knife and creating the, um, the forms that way. Um, this is what happens when I add oil paint to the tar. This one is called Dive, and that quote is, O oh, Ahab, what shall be grand in thee? It must needs be plucked from the skies and dive for in the deep and featured in the unbodied air. Loved that quote because it seems to mix up the elements of, you know, the uh, of, of sky and water. There's it's so in the in the particular painting, I felt there was a celestial element, but it's also an underwater. It could be an underwater scene too, light streaming in from above, and something's plunging down, uh, diving down. Maybe it's the whale, maybe it's the ship going down, but we're witnessing um, the bubbles coming up as as the ship descends into the darker depths. Um, Corpo Santos, love the, the scene of Ahab, the demagogue, uh, in, uh, enchanting his men, his followers to become his minions in this mad and self-destructive quest of revenge on the whale. Uh, so he says, as the St. Elmo's fire collects in the masts, uh, as he's rallying the men, O oh, thou foundling fire, thou hermit immemorial, thou too hast thy incommunicable riddle, thy unparticipated grief. And this particular one makes use of um, 24 karat gold leaf. And that's the other material that became part of the series. I found that the gold leaf was a perfect uh, antipode to the tar, whereas the tar is this dark, chthonic, uh, you know, gunk, this toxic, chemically um, repugnant uh, prima materia, you know, the alchemist's base matter. The gold is the opposite. It's the celestial. It's the spiritual. It's the pure. Um, it's the aspired to. Uh, and there are two sides of the capitalist coin, as it were. You've got fossil fuels on one side, the the toxic waste of Western industrial development and global reach, global overreach, and the gold for which the um, the colonists first came, the the riches to be had from the new world, uh, and I like that in combining these two, the gold seems to be like a fire, especially in this particular one, like a fire falling from from heaven, like a a kind of a rain, uh, or somebody said to me, it's like the cosmos is uh, breaking and falling in, in flame. I love that image. Um, so I'll just, I I'll show you just one more. This is another of the images that uses gold leaf. 
and in this one, I've got um, all the different aspects I've got of the of the procedure. I've got the applied tar on the bottom. You can see areas where it's wiped away. There's oil paint to bring out the lights and um, a gold leaf on top. And I called this one Westward um, simply because I wanted this to be the ship of state. I wanted us. I want. I want that dimension to be here. I want to me. They. They. These paintings started as. A, um, responses to Moby Dick and to some of those bigger themes that I mentioned, I mentioned earlier, like the uh, one of the one of the key takeaways from Moby Dick, to use a uh, silly term, for me is the limitations of human knowledge. I feel that's a theme that runs through the through the novel entirely, and is, is one that I I just feel viscerally. I just having you know. He didn't have the benefit of uh, the existential movement when he was writing, but he's a proto-existentialist in some ways. A lot of the book seems to me about the futility of human endeavor, um, and or at least the, the limits of our ability to understand our place in the universe, to make sense of the cosmos and nature and our place within it. Uh, and so in the ship, I see the voyage out, you know, I see a very basic archetype of the human uh, journey and it's besieged, it's um, beleaguered, it's um, overcome in fog and nebulosity and the darkness of the tar. And uh, we don't know if it's on its way back to port or if it's on its way out to kill, it's simply out in the void, suspended. And that for me was kind of the key metaphor for this whole series. It's, I'm not trying to, con I don't, I don't feel like, I'm not a political painter. I don't, I don't want to drive home a message very pedantically or um, not really, I, I guess I'm a little bit of an activist because there's this political dimension, but at the same time, I think these are just profound truths of human reality that artists have been grappling with for the, for ages and will never stop grappling with. So um, Melville is a kind of just a companion to me uh, in this series. And he, he was inspirational and emboldened me to, to go in this route. Um, and I, I think that there's a lot to be learned from Melville's just, you know, headlong in as you say Yongxia, into so many uh so many big themes he's our shakespeare he's our tolstoy this is the this is the bible of american uh hubris you know that it's it's the blueprint for disaster that america has been it can't seem to help itself from drawing every drawing a new every new decade couple others I can show um horizon sails I like the the dark in this one and the starkness um and the featurelessness of the whiteness in the sky that dark and light the you know the, the black and white is very Melvillean to me the the whiteness of the whale and uh so I try to I try to play in some paintings with with the whiteness like coming in as a bleaching or a you know an absence of color non being and being if you are, if you will. Uh, I started using nineteenth century frames too because I found that um, to be appropriate. Um, I did a, a whole series of miniatures using nineteenth century. Um, well, tintype frames. So these are tiny paintings on tar, uh, tar on, in tar on paper, uh, enclosed in these Victorian frames. Um, and this is about as abstract as the series ever got. And I, I kind of consider this the last in the series because it's so chaotic in a way. It's like the darkness is about to really overwhelm everything. And the, the forms are dissolving. It's called Argonautica. Uh, and the quote is, yes, the world's a ship on its passage out. 
Well, that should give you a, a just a, a snapshot of this series. Um, it's ongoing. I'm continuing to have shows. And um, as you say, Dennis, there's a small book that accompanies the, the exhibition. So a couple of themes that I like to introduce to students when I work with them is the, the idea of the chiaroscuro, the, the dark and light. There's a great quote from Clement Greenberg, who was the champion of Jackson Pollock, describing a painting of Pollock's in 1943 he, he identifies something he calls an American chiaroscuro, which dominated Melville, Hawthorne, Poe. So there, I think, is a crossover between the literature and visual art in, on this, uh, th this sort of bleak or um, un, unprettified view. Um, Leslie Fielder said that American literature is distinguished by the number of dangerous and disturbing books in its in its canon, and American scholarship by its ability to conceal this fact. <laughs> Which uh, I love that quote, and I think this that Melville knew just how dangerous a book he'd written. I mean, he called it a wicked book, right? Um, it's it's subversive, and it continues to be a dark and dangerous book. And we need that. The times demand it. Art helps us see what, and talk about things that we know to be true, but generally don't know how to talk about um, or can't comprehend in other ways. Yonja and I had talked about, um, you mentioned Tim Morton. So we talked about his notion of the hyper object as something too big to fully grasp. And Melville treats Moby Dick the whale a very similar way. It's too vast to fully be comprehended. And you know that's, to me, uh, also another facet of the novel that, well, that relates to the idea of the in unknowableness of things in general, but also to the ungraspable nature of climate change fact that it it exists we know that but we can't fully comprehend it so there's a crossover there that i find kind of interesting with melville what do you think about that yonja well uh uh it's really interesting to me the way you looked at melville's novel you know it's connected with connectedness to um, Morton's idea of hyper objects is really amazing to me to see that I have been uh, reading, studying and teaching this novel, but <laughs> the first time um, uh, this is this is the first time I, I have this connection. It's by means of you. Thank you. Uh, yes, maybe the way uh, Marvel predicted the outcomes of uh, um this problematic relationship a romantic uh, connection to uh, nature from 19th century mindset he predict predicted the outcomes of emersonian in many ways yes they were agreeing about the man and nature relationship with emerson but i think marvel was not agreeing with emerson about the <laughs> you know this uh Kantian, you know, idealist version of uh, seeing the outer reality. Melville was much more uh, realistic and in many ways naturalistic, I think. Uh, he wasn't so sure about the uh, hierarchy between uh, object and, you know, subject relationship that Emerson ca came up with, uh, inspired by the German romantics. So... <laughs> I think that way, um, Melville's prediction 
of the outcomes of that mindset was is similar to how Morton comes up with this concept of hi, uh, hyper objects. Um, yes, this is <laughs> what I think about this connection. <laughs> the image that comes to my yeah. mind is the myth of the myth of Sisyphus. Uh, yes, but uh, I I think. Um, I think all of this uh, stuff related to Moby Dick is interesting because, you know, I went through American schools and encountered Moby Dick twice that I can remember uh, once in high school, you know, and, um, you know, in high school. And I was I was I was very interested in literature and, you know, re read everything that was put in front of me. And but Moby Dick is the one that stands out as the one. <laughs> it, was, it was really hard, really, really. Yeah. Um, Definitely. Yeah, and, and and part of it is because we I don't think we realize, and it, maybe it's the inability to look in inward, but we didn't see uh, Moby Dick as kind of a uh, you know having a premonition of the future or anything like that. We were just you know, I mean, we were really trying not didn't have the tools to interpret you know what he was talking about. Uh, when I got to college or graduate school, I forget when I read it again, you know, it began to, you know, I began to pull the strings together and, you know, it began to make a little bit more sense. But in terms of, uh, you know, seeing it as kind of a, having a parable like quality, uh, I don't think that really exists in, in, you know, in the United States, uh, at least, you know, you don't hear people, but what I want to do is, you know, get it in front of say, your book in front of some people and test that theory that I have that we don't really quite grasp it maybe because we're too close to it and we're experienced we're, mm -hmm. we're on the ship <laughs> we're, we're like oh hey oh that's where we are i mean you know maybe maybe dennis it is maybe because we are the white whale <laughs> right so i don't know <laughs> So at any rate, anyway, it's getting late there. I know you're both way over okay. the other side of the world. And um, I just want to thank you for just incredible uh, presentation <laughs> and, and all of your thoughts and on this thank uh, you. so important. Thank topic. you for inviting us. Thank yeah. you, Dennis. Uh, so thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much for watching our video today. I want to remind you that we will we'll be having another discussion on, on Moby Dick in the future. We hope you'll return. Another thing I want to ask you, if you could uh, hit the like button and the subscribe button. We love your support and we look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you so much.